Conquer the Noise is a podcast produced by Unconquered, an independent agency challenging brand perspective to redefine content. This podcast is dedicated to telling stories of outstanding ideas and people who have found their way amongst the chatter. We are excited to have Kara Golden, the CEO and founder of Hint Water. Kara started the company with a simple idea, to make water that tastes great. We're going to talk about her new book, Undaunted, and some of the lessons she's learned as a successful entrepreneur. Kara, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you making the time. Of course. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I received your uh, little box of goodies, which I really appreciate. The book, the my favorite actually was the book and the dog toy because I obviously <laughs> am, love my dog. Um, and I really am going to start, I think, incorporating. I want to steal that and make our, our own dog toy swag for, for our clients. Um, you know, I read through the book and I, it's funny, the un, Undaunted, the title of it, reminds me so much of our name, Unconquered. Um, and I think there's a lot of overlap. And as I was reading your story, I found a lot of just personal uh, connection to it and, and a lot of the reasons or motivations that, that inspired us to start an agency and inspired us to name it what it was. Um, so I would love to hear how you arrived at the name Undaunted and, and what that means for you. Well, I, thank you. Uh, you know, more than anything, so a little bit of backstory. When I s- decided to write a book, it was based out of the fact that I had a journal that was about mm-hmm. 600 pages. Mm-hmm. And as I was uh, doing a ton of public speaking and then also just touring the country, building out uh, my brand hint and meeting with customers along the way, I felt like the way that I could actually get my message out, not only for what is hint, but Mm -hmm. also why I was thinking the way that I was thinking or doing whatever I was doing was because of a story. Mm -hmm. And I felt like just by sharing my story, Mm -hmm. that that really helped people to sort of catch up to where I was at. Mm -hmm. And, and again, like this, this journal, really stemmed from, I, I, I sort of was prompted by mm-hmm. these, the questions that I was asked by mm-hmm. buyers or, or, you know, questions at the end of a, a talk that I was doing. And I would think about those questions even after I left the room. And I'd mm-hmm. say, I wasn't questioning sort of how I had answered it, but I thought, oh, there's another great story that, mm-hmm. you know, would also be relevant that would really help that person. And as I started to write these stories out, I thought, gosh, there's a lot of people that are not sitting in the room that could actually benefit from these stories. Mm -hmm. And I started actually to tell some of these stories even on my social, um, Mm -hmm. on LinkedIn primarily. And then I thought, you know, I should figure out a way to bind my journal. And so I reached out to a friend of mine who is an author and I said, so what do you think is the best way to bind my journal and kind of get it out mm-hmm. there? And she said, you mean write a book? And I said, <laughs> no, I'm a CEO of a company. I have no time to write a book. And so mm-hmm. when I told her what I had, she said, you've already written the book. Let me see it. And so I shared it with her and she said, you have at least one, maybe two books in there mm-hmm. with all of your stories. And that was, you know, that was really kind of the, the sort of the ethos for writing this book. But in terms of naming it, it over the years, people had called me relentless, um, mm-hmm. you know, just so, so many of the stories that I would share with them or they would really put a stake in the ground and say, you're undaunted, you're fearless, you're this, Mm -hmm. you're this. Mm -hmm. And so it really came very naturally. Frankly, just like naming the product Hint. I mean, a lot of people have asked me if I used a naming agency. Mm -hmm. Nope. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, we just sort of applied for the trademarks on Hint and Mm -hmm. and were able to get it. But it wasn't, I think sometimes if you make things too hard or you overthink things and they don't really come naturally to you, mm-hmm. then it it doesn't come naturally to others either. Mm-hmm. And I think that there's when people are reading this this book and they look at the title Undaunted, uh, you know, well, many of them see that it is getting over 
fears and some of the things that I went through were really scary. I mean, there were other stories that, you know, people have shared with me. I cannot believe that you went through that with Whole Foods or whatever, and they mm -hmm. laugh at it. And I said, it's, it's always funny when you're not actually in the room. When you're in mm -hmm. the room, it's really scary, right? Mm -hmm. There's mortified. a lot of those stories. Yeah. You're horrified, right? Yeah. And, um, and so again, I, I really did this more as a learning for, um, for other people. But I have to tell you too, that I think in many ways, writing a book is, is therapeutic, right? To sort mm -hmm. of like get through all of those well, it is. challenging it's, times. For sure. And I, I mean, I, it, it breeds like a journal. So it's funny you say that. I can, I can totally connect that now. It does feel like a personal exploration almost of, of what happened or a detailing of it. Um, it's funny. Like some people, I think journal for like, the story side of it and then i think others mm -hmm. sort of story journal for me maybe it was a combination of both but others for the um the um i guess therapeutic aspect of it of getting it out venting having a safe place to let it out um and you know there's and there's a little bit of both and i think that's what i appreciate and i think there's some some interesting really personal learnings that you reveal um i think Thank you could have hung on to them well, i think some of them were so deep i was like I, wow i wish i would i, I want to explore can't wait to explore these in conversation you know yeah, 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 no, and, and we can definitely do that. But I also just think that one thing that I always share with people is mm -hmm. that when you go through challenging times, often you just want to forget about them and mm -hmm. you just don't want, you want to move forward. And while I think that that is, it has its place, I also think that we should learn from our experiences. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's hard. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's really uncomfortable to go mm -hmm. back and think about, is there something I could have done? And mm -hmm. sometimes there is, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it comes to you right away. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of, you know, one of the stories with Starbucks, when we got into Starbucks, it was a huge high. And then when we were removed from the cases of all the Starbucks, I mean, that was a big low. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, instead of feeling so angry about what had happened and ripped off and something, you know, terrible happened, what I took the time to go back and think about what could I have done differently in that situation that would have helped me to not be in the situation that I was in where I had a ton of inventory that was sitting in my warehouse. I had to go back to my investors and share that I was, uh, you know, had this inventory that I probably was going to have to destroy. It was not an, un it was a very uncomfortable situation, mm -hmm. but I thought if I wouldn't have put all my eggs in that basket, right? If I wouldn't have relied on that revenue from that, that much revenue, it was 40% of my overall business was coming from Starbucks or planned to be mm -hmm. coming from Starbucks. And when they decided to end the partnership with two weeks notice, I had no options. And that's what was so upsetting to me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the lesson I learned from that and, and one that I still hold to this day and mm -hmm. my team has to hold to this day too, because I, it's, it's part of my journey is that when you, when you don't have options, when you mm -hmm. don't look at, uh, you know, different possibilities, especially when things are going right, figure out what, when things if things were to go wrong, are you mm -hmm. prepared? And mm -hmm. I think that that was the big story that I got out of out of that. And and I just relived it, even uh, writing this book and and sort of thinking more and more. And it just became that much more clear. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm curious when you, options, are, I think, are always having options. I think it's one of those things that is. Um, provides empowerment, it provides the ability to, to, to write, to, to get yourself totally. out of bad situations. And I'm curious, you know, that's con obviously connected to prepare, being prepared. Um, so, so I'm curious to like how you, how you're preparing yourself in other ways. Like, so, that, so for example, in this situation, hindsight's 2020, 20, right. But like going into, going into it and having, you know, Starbucks, having me be such a huge part of your revenue, how else would you have prepared? Now looking back, I'm just, trying to connect those dots to see how you would have maybe done things a little bit differently. Would you have maybe had other options as far as like store partners or would there have been? For sure. I mean, you know, I, I think anybody who builds a plan that, that has 40% of their revenue coming from, from yeah. one source 
is uh, foolish, right? Yeah. And you know, in the agency world, if you've got forty yeah. percent of your overall business sitting with one client, I mean, you know, hindsight twenty twenty, you're like, well, that was foolish, right? I shouldn't have done that. But it's uh, when you're in it and you think everything's great. And and that's the challenge. You never really know, right? I mean, look mm -hmm. over the over the years. I mean, we've seen suppliers, for example, that have gone out of business. We thought everything was fine. We were getting all of the supply that we needed out of them, but then they mm -hmm. ran out of cash, and mm -hmm. they weren't sitting there, ex you know, sharing that information with us. So I think at, at at all levels of your company, you need to figure out how. If, if this great thing that is sitting in front of me, the shiny apple goes away tomorrow, how can I protect myself? And mm -hmm. I think that that is, think about every aspect of your business mm -hmm. and, and you know, not only uh, revenue streams or uh, suppliers, but also people. As mm -hmm. I you know, say to my teams, Look, if you have somebody who is incredible and so important, look, it's a free world. They can go. They can go and look for another job. They can go somewhere mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't really understand, you don't have somebody who can step in to do those roles and really maybe they might not be immediately as good as that person, but you have to be able to protect yourself or else you cause strain on mm -hmm your company and you get mm -hmm. this i mean mm -hmm. it's just it it's reality and it's mm -hmm. something that i think is an important lesson and and a lesson that we've learned over time but now from that starbucks relationship i didn't do it right that time but i also believe that when bad things are happening that they don't last forever and the mm -hmm. best that you can hope for is that it mm -hmm. gets better sooner and mm -hmm. so for us, that sooner came when Amazon reached out to us and they said, hey, we're, we're starting this grocery thing and mm -hmm. we're going to sell grocery products online. Now, Amazon actually used to be a client of mine back way back when, when I was mm -hmm. at America Online running the e-commerce and shopping partnership. Mm -hmm. So I know that Amazon started as a bookseller and they continue to grow their businesses. They've may surprise some people, but they've had some failures along the way. And when I well, heard- the failures they, never get talked about, right? Yeah. And and so yeah. I, I've sort of followed them over the years and I thought, oh, wow, they're getting into grocery. How, yeah. like, what's your strategy? I was just really curious about it. And and again, like this gentleman that I was talking to said, look, we're, we're not doing perishable. We're going to go and we're going to start with some, you know, real essential products. And, and mm -hmm. yours is one that I go to. He actually said, I uh, go to Starbucks every morning and I get my latte and I buy a bottle of Hint. And I thought, mm. you know, do I tell him mm -hmm. that we're getting kicked out of out of mm -hmm. Starbucks or do I just uh, tell him that we can deliver right away because I've got two truckloads of products sitting in the warehouse. And so mm -hmm. I chose the latter and, mm -hmm. uh, and he wired me money to uh, bring in Hint. And and it was at that moment when I realized, first of all, I might not have been part of this kind of beta that he was doing if I wouldn't have had the product ready right away, mm -hmm. um, which I did because of, of Starbucks mm -hmm. and that situation. But in addition to that, mm -hmm. over the next few months, I learned from our relationship with Amazon that many of the people who were buying Hint were also buying things like health related products so mm -hmm. they were describing this consumer that was shopping and buying hint on amazon as a consumer that was significantly different than one that was buying other beverage products on mm -hmm. amazon yeah and so i was fascinated by this Me and too. i and i said okay so they're buying diabetes monitors and um and you know different different types of exercise gear that really said that they're engaged and they're focused on staying healthy or getting healthy. And I said to the buyer, I would love to reach out to a few of these customers and talk to them. And he said, Jeff Bezos isn't going to give you the emails for, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, this can, for our Amazon sales. And it was at that moment when I realized something really interesting. 
here I had been building Hint for seven years, Mm -hmm. doing it the way that beverage companies do it, which, uh, you know, to date was essentially, you know, selling in stores, Mm -hmm. whether they're big box stores or club or specialty stores like Whole Foods, I was doing it their way. And Mm -hmm. suddenly I branched out. I had another revenue stream coming from Amazon, but I didn't have a direct relationship with the customer. And so that was the moment when I said, I should launch my own store. If nothing else, maybe I'll get, I won't get as many of those customers that Amazon has, but I'll get some customers that are going to come into our store for whatever reason, that maybe they don't have the, the flavors that they want on the Amazon site. They're going to come in and then I can have a conversation with them and build a relationship with them. And it was, it was really at that moment when we launched our site, it was super bare bones site that I realized that it, it wasn't giant initially, but there were things that Amazon wasn't able to do that we were able to do. We had over 20 flavors, for example, of mm-hmm. water mm-hmm. and they weren't going to launch all 20 flavors on this site. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Whole Foods and Costco and Kroger and everybody else wasn't going to carry all 20. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, as long as my site has meaning and has purpose, there will be customers that are going to search. And as long as I can be really diligent on SEO and everything else in order to, and and ads and, and all of that stuff, I can gain an audience. I didn't know how big of an audience I could gain, but I thought it'll be something. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, I will now have three revenue streams. Mm -hmm. I will have Mm -hmm. stores, Amazon, and also my own, but with my own, I'm able to act as the retailer. I'm able to build an email list that I can go out and talk to my consumer and sell them more product. And at the time too, the other piece that was a competitive advantage for my site was that um, Amazon wasn't doing, they hadn't launched Amazon Prime yet. And so Mm -hmm. that was essentially their subscription program. Mm -hmm. And so we launched a subscription program pretty quickly that really differentiated us. But Mm -hmm. people would ask me even early on, should I buy at Amazon or should I buy from you guys? Because they wanted us to stay alive and like mm-hmm. be able to and support us in, in many ways. And still to this day, we have consumers who ask us, should we buy your product at Costco or should we buy it directly from you? And, you know, the answer is really simple. We want, it's your decision. You're the mm-hmm. customer. You can buy it wherever you want. We want all of our channels to be successful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But Again, it goes back to, I I think in many ways, I thank Starbucks for that opportunity where, you know, it sort of just, it created this journey and I paid attention and I learned a lot along the way from Starbucks, from Amazon, um, and then from launching our own site. But Mm -hmm. again, so many of those things when people will come to me and they'll say, should I launch my own site? I'm like, you know, where do I start? Mm -hmm. Right. Because for me, it really is about the journey and like, why did I do it? I didn't do it because I was sitting there thinking, should I launch my own site? It it, so much of the building of Hint has been a natural progression, really Mm -hmm. servicing the consumer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I I love how that Starbucks story, instead of being this doomsday event turned into the, I think, foundation or growth of a brand strategy or, 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 or growing the brand strategy. Um, and one of the things that I experience a lot, at least from, you know, I do mentorship with uh, other young creatives um, mm-hmm. or just other young people interested in business. Um, and I think a lot of times people see like challenges as barriers mm-hmm. and not as like opportunity or as um, something that is becomes no longer viewed as possible, but is viewed as impossible. Um, and I think it's one of those great stories that shows that it's how you react to it, not necessarily what happens to you. And I would love to hear like, do you think that, is that just an attitude or is that just a, is that just a choice? We just, you just decide to, to choose to look at it from a different perspective. How can we help other people? I think 
harness this idea of of challenges as opportunity? Yeah, I think, well, first of all, I'm not going to lie. I mean, when when bad things happen and challenging days are, look, a client like drops you and you're like, ah! It's hard, know, it and hurts. Right, yeah. it hard, it, it hurts. But I think it's, it's really taking time to go back and look at mm-hmm. those. And sometimes things don't make sense and you just sit there and you're pissed, right? Mm-hmm. And, and you don't mm-hmm. really, maybe you have a bad boss who told you something that you're like, mm-hmm. ah, they're, you know, mm-hmm. they're a loser, you know, they, they don't mm-hmm. know anything. But, you know, it, it really is, I, I feel like when I go back in time and I look at those challenging times, there's always something to be learned from, mm-hmm. You know, even those hard conversations or those challenging times. Look, one of the stories in the book is the 2008, 2009 financial crisis. Mm -hmm. I, like many other people, would have liked to have forgotten about that and Mm -hmm. and moved on. It was a super challenging time for me as an entrepreneur, as somebody who was running out of cash that nobody was writing checks. I mean, it was just, Mm -hmm. it was a terrible, terrible, terrible time. Mm -hmm. And when I would share that story with new entrepreneurs of, you know, I would be thinking, always have a couple of years worth of cash in the bank because you just never know what would happen. People mm-hmm. would say, why, why do you say that? I mean, it sounds right, but why do you say that? And I would go back and I would think about that time and they'd say, oh, but 2008, 2000, that'll never happen again. I mean, that, that's just, that's, that just won't happen again. Never say Maybe that, that won't happen, but yeah. then you have a pandemic. Yeah. Right. Which is right. It's just it, it it's different in some ways, but mm-hmm. in some ways the same. And when I look back on 2008 and 2009 and things that I didn't do right, things that scared me at the time, mm-hmm. I felt so prepared at the beginning of this pandemic to go and figure out how do I move forward? And mm-hmm. I kept saying, I can't stay. We can't stay as a company complacent. We have to figure out how to move forward. We can we can go slowly. Mm-hmm. We can, but we have to really look at how do we service the co- the consumer, and still have enough capital in the bank. So while everybody is being told shelter in place and stay home, don't go into the office. I was saying to my CFO and our team, we need to go raise money right now. Mm-hmm. We're, we only have a year's worth of capital in the bank and we need two years worth of capital in the bank. He's like, you're, you're not going to raise money on Zoom. Forget it. And I said, mm-hmm. we have to figure out a way. Zoom is a tool. It is mm-hmm. not a reason why we can't raise money. But remember 2020 in March, I mean, people were like, what? You know, yeah, you have to, it was, I mean, it was foreign, right? Yeah. And, and we ended up raising during a time when no one else was raising. Mm -hmm. And it was actually, there was capital out there and we got it done in like 90 days because we had a great plan and there was, you know, we had huge growth coming and we were an essential Mm -hmm. product. So there were a lot of, you know, factors to it. But again, when I, when I looked back on that challenging time that I could never figure out why in the heck did I go through that? Why did I start a company, you know, essentially a couple of years before that I thought, Mm -hmm you know, this is, this is the worst time. That challenging time helped me to be better for the next challenging time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think that that is one, look, nobody wants to put themselves into a position of discomfort. Mm -hmm. And it's just, especially when times are great. And Mm -hmm. I think that it's such an important, um, thing to, for everyone to do. And especially, uh, when things look like they're looking good, everything's fine. What mm-hmm. could happen? Mm-hmm. Well, have have like a doomsday day where you just sit there and you say, "How could things really fall apart? How mm-hmm. could you know?" And and again, you don't have to focus your entire business on that and always be thinking that way. But it's not a bad strategy to know that you know if if something does happen, if something you know, challenging happens. Um, look, no one thought that supply chain, for example, when you've got a physical product that is so many companies and so many industries were relying on Asia. Mm-hmm. And I mean, no one ever thought that it would become 
what it is today. I mean, every smart CEO who relied on Asia to have goods today is figuring out how to diversify, figuring out how not to put their eggs in one basket for a variety of reasons. But, you know, again, like what, what can we learn from that challenging time? And maybe Mm -hmm. you didn't do it right um, Mm -hmm. this time, but figure out how do you do it better next time? Mm-hmm. And I think I think like circling this all back to to challenging times and and creating out of it. Um, that's essentially how the brand was started, right? You were mm-hmm. you were going through health um, health issues, weren't necessarily yeah. like drinking a lot of water or and I it hated water. Solu- yeah, it came became your solution, <laughs> right? I would love to hear how you just navigated that. So you, I mean, navigating from okay, I need to change, make a change in my life um, to tinkering in your kitchen and, and developing flavors and how you're going to create this. Um, and then coming up with the idea to get it and help other people who are going through the same thing. I would love to hear that part of that story. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, you know, I think sometimes taking a break and, you know, mm-hmm. maybe it's a break on a weekend or in my case, it was a break from working. I had uh, you know, a great opportunity to take a little bit of a break. I didn't take a total break. I was mm-hmm. a mother to uh, young kids, had four mm-hmm. young kids when I started Hint. But I, I really wanted, I really felt like I was listening to my elders saying like, you know, those years go fast, you know, it, mm-hmm. you, you can't replace them. Mm-hmm. There was like little bugs in my ears sort, right. sort of saying like, don't, you know, don't let it pass by. And so I really wanted to take that opportunity to, you know, kind of take a break and do that. And it was during that time when I really also started looking at myself and I thought I'm not, I definitely want to go back to work. I thought that work would be back in tech again, mm-hmm. but uh, for me, I I was like looking for kind of a newer opportunity that wasn't doing exactly what I had been doing at America Online, mm-hmm. and it was during that time that I also said I want to get in shape. I want to start feeling better. I want to start looking better. I had gained a bunch of weight. I my I had a terrible stomach that I just mm-hmm. assumed was just like life. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I just like people would say like, you know, do you have like, are you gluten intolerant? Like all these things. I tried everything and nothing fixed my stomach. And then mm-hmm. in addition to that, my skin had developed terrible acne. And I think mm-hmm. that that was sort of where I said, I got to figure this stuff out because mm-hmm. I don't want to walk around with acne in my thirties. Like it was mm-hmm. just weird. Mm-hmm. And when I really started looking at myself, that's when I started really digging into the food that I was eating because I thought mm-hmm. it has to be here somewhere. I had been exercising, doing everything else right. And I never looked at my drinks. When you think about it, everybody always talks about food when they're talking about diets, at least. Absolutely. In, certainly 17 years ago, but yeah. I think it's even true today. And I didn't look at ingredients in in drinks until it happened by accident. And I Mm -hmm. looked at my diet soda and my diet Coke in particular, and I looked at the ingredient label and I thought, there's a lot of stuff in here that if it was food, I would discontinue using it. Mm -hmm. But because it's a drink, why am I making an exception? Well, Mm -hmm. I'm making an exception because it's called diet. And Mm -hmm. for me, the word diet meant health. And Mm -hmm. it had meant health for many, many years. I started drinking Diet Coke when I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. I was an early adopter um, to Diet Coke. I mean, truly, like Diet Mm -hmm. Coke was, that's when it came out. My mom was a tab drinker. Of course, I wasn't Mm going to drink what my mom was drinking. Mm -hmm. And for me, Diet Coke, like I got used to it. I got addicted to it, but I never thought that there was anything wrong with it. When I decided based on the ingredients that I was reading, that I would discontinue it temporarily for a couple of weeks. That's when I realized that I was really thirsty, that I Mm -hmm. had not been drinking water for years um, because I didn't like the taste of water. And so in order to keep hydrated, because I was parched, I started throwing fruit in water, Mm -hmm. thinking that 
maybe even I was cheating a little bit just by throwing some fruit in the water, but I had mm -hmm. to like drink something. Mm -hmm. And two and a half weeks later, I lost over 20 pounds. I, wow. my skin cleared up and I didn't anticipate that it would happen that fast or mm -hmm. that it was, um, or like I was shocked mm -hmm. that this had occurred. I didn't make any other change in my food and and so that hmm. for me, I think, was just really, really surprising. And what did I do next? I I called Coke and I wanted to know like if anybody else had experienced this. I mean, here I was a marketer and I mm -hmm. just thought, why am I the only one who thinks that diet means health? Mm -hmm. I mean, really, like I think that there are a lot of people that think it. Oh, absolutely. And I certainly did. And so that was like, the process that I was going through. But then after kind of living this way for the next few months, I started going into grocery stores and I thought, I don't want to cut up fruit every single day. It's a hassle. I want to mm -hmm. grab a drink. And everything that was in the market had some sort of sweetener. It wasn't just about sugar. Mm -hmm. It was about sweet. And so for me, diet sweeteners, they were sweet, but they had less calories than regular sugar and I bought mm -hmm. into that but mm -hmm. it wasn't actually getting me where I wanted to be mm -hmm. and so I thought when I couldn't find this product this ready to drink product that just had fruit and water in it I thought I should just go develop this product I know exactly what I want mm -hmm. why don't I just go do it and I think more than anything too and I share the story with a lot of entrepreneurs for for me it was never about let me just go and build the next vitamin water build the next diet coke and make you know billions of dollars for me mm -hmm. it it was a purpose it there was mm -hmm. a purpose behind it and mm -hmm. a purpose in helping people mm -hmm. that i believed that i had this idea that i could fairly easily get it to market and i could see whether or not it could get traction. And if it got traction, then maybe somebody would buy it and I could go back to being in tech. I never, I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't think about distribution. I didn't think about, you know, I couldn't be on the shelf if I didn't have a longer shelf life. How was I going to get there? And so that was another thing that you'll read in this book too is, is, you know, going through the process of, you know, you think you're, you think you've got it made when you go and get it into the store. And mm -hmm. then all of a sudden they're like, oh, well, the finish line isn't really there. It's actually mm -hmm. over there. And then you get mm -hmm. to that finish line and then they're like, oh, well, that was good. Mm -hmm. But then it's, it's a little bit further down the road too. And that, mm -hmm. that's been the last 16 years. And so mm -hmm. it's kind of, I equate, being an entrepreneur to uh to being in a game of of puzzle right that oh, totally. you have to right you you just keep building and then the puzzle just keeps b getting bigger you didn't have the picture for the puzzle in the first place you thought you did but yeah. you didn't really totally. and then people take pieces away and then you're like you got to still stay in it and keep working at it and mm -hmm. uh it's, you know, it's, it's fun. You learn a ton, but it's hard. It's so hard. Right? It's so hard. And, and I was saying this before, like, you know, we um, have it had a little client, low, like a little slowing period of client work. So, you know, we took the opportunity to focus in on our own brand and start breaking it down. And in that process, you realize, we realize, oh, wow, we could be doing this better. We could be doing this better. We could be doing this better. Smart. And suddenly my, my, my slow September turned into a very busy September because you realize that there's a lot of like little things that need to be done, tightened up. We could think through this a little bit further, um, which all, you know, I think all informs just a larger brand strategy, which is really where my head's been at the last couple couple weeks or a couple months, I should say, um, just for our own brand. Because um, we do so much of it for other people that it's really easy to ignore your own sometimes. Um, at least on, for our, in, in our line of business, it is, right? Um, yeah. No, and, and I think that's true. And you, it, it's, it's, you have to make time to come back to yeah. 
you know, that, and, and, you know, that's another thing. I mean, I, I share with people, I think that the thing that people don't really realize about entrepreneurs and, and in particular entrepreneurs don't realize this is that time is your most valuable thing. Yes. Right. 100%. And, and it's like, or when attention. people say, you know, should I go and like meet with whatever Costco, just cause they, you know, want to meet with me. And I'm like, do you, are you ready? Like, could you actually fulfill an order for, yeah. uh, for Costco? No. And I, and I thought, well, why don't you just tell them that you're actually not, you, you have some supply chain issues to figure out first, yeah. but you're really excited about an opportunity and we'll see you in six months or whatever that is, because if you could actually get a lot more done with your time by not doing these meetings, these extra meetings, then mm -hmm. I mean, right? Like, well, not only that, but I think there's a lot of power in honesty and transparency. And when mm -hmm. you're upfront with a uh, with a person like that, who's totally, it, it adds a lot of, <coughs> I think, credit and um, authenticity to you. And I think they're going to take you a lot more serious than if you say yes and then you come in and you're completely unprepared. Um, and it just makes you look like amateur hour uh, and it, it, it does yeah. more more harm than good well it's funny i we we met over the years with walmart mm -hmm. um i think seven times over the years over the last 16 years and the mm -hmm. buyer joked i think on round five or something uh -huh. you know he was he was like i think you're the only merchant that we've ever allowed to come in this many times. And I think part of part of it was we were ready or we thought we were ready, but then we started really asking, you know, kind of the hard questions and almost mm -hmm. talking them out of working with us in, mm -hmm. in some ways, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it, it was, it was just interesting. I mean, the, the, the number one concern I had was, were we a big enough brand to actually go into a big, market like Walmart. Like I and I was really struggling to come up with a brand that had actually built their brand inside of Walmart versus actually becoming a brand and then, and then going, going to Walmart. Yeah. And and so it and I think sometimes those meetings can be helpful if you've got the ability to be honest and authentic mm -hmm. about what your concerns are and mm -hmm. And so, you know, finally, 16, well, actually at the time, 14 years later, we went into Walmart and now we do really well in Walmart and we're a big mm -hmm. enough brand to be able to go in there. But I think, again, like so many lessons that I've learned along, uh, along the way, and, and I think meetings need to have purpose. Meetings mm -hmm. need to, they, they shouldn't just, you shouldn't just go into Amazon because you hear everybody's going into Amazon, right? Mm -hmm, you need mm -hmm, to really mm -hmm. understand why you would want to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the, one of the things that I, when I speak with early founders or, or people early in their business or brand is they haven't yet taken the time to like come up with a, I guess a brand book or a set of values or a, a North star to help guide them. Mm -hmm. I think, and I'm curious, it sounds like you did earlier when you were speaking to as far as like, finding purpose and helping other people, um, you know, have better choices to make when it comes to having, um, you know, the, the things that they consume in, in their diet. Um, so I'm curious to what that was like for you. Did you, did you sort of map out like a, a, a larger brand purpose idea, um, things that you were adamant about? So I know there's, there are some interesting stories within the book that challenge those things. Like you can't, you can't use these ingredients because they won't be shelf stable or, or last very long. You can't, you can't do this. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to how, and those take, and I think making those decisions take um, an understanding of the why and, and of why you're doing this. Um, so I'm curious, like how that manifested. How we thought about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think we've had, a few iterations of our brand book, but uh -huh. it, it goes back to, and, and that's happened, I think, as, we, as we've expanded the product line even beyond mm -hmm. water. Um, but I think it really goes back to satisfying the consumer mm -hmm. and, and which is different than asking the consumer, but I think actually solving problems for the consumer. And so, mm -hmm. you know, at the core of the, of the brand, the, 
over 90% of our revenue is water and Mm -hmm. that's what we do. And so it's, you know, it really is helping people drink water Mm -hmm. that tastes better. Um, Mm -hmm. But what is the brand halo beyond that? It's Mm -hmm. helping people to stay healthy, get healthy. Mm -hmm. And so we can actually do other products that, that go beyond that. Now, I think that when you dig into some of the things you talked about, the ingredients, I think that, that the challenge with a lot of ingredients is a, they're not that great for you, but Mm -hmm. I think consumers also, what I've learned is the simpler your product is, the better. It has mm-hmm. to taste great or mm-hmm. f- or feel great or work if I guess if it's a sunscreen or deodorant or whatever that is, but it it really I I think less is more. I've mm-hmm. learned that. I mean, one of the stories in the book is my first job was working in a toy store and mm-hmm. I learned, you know, at age 14 as I you know became sort of the unofficial toy buyer at, in inside of the toy store helping the mm-hmm. owner of the small toy store is that you don't have to have lots of toys in a toy store in fact that actually uh, limits the consumer's mm-hmm. ability to figure out what they actually want mm-hmm. and instead what you need is you need good stuff right mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you need a selection of of things that people really want and so mm-hmm. I think that 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 really goes back to the brand book and, and to the ethos as well is that I people have said, are you guys going to build, you know, have 2000 products? I, I doubt it. I mean, mm-hmm. never say never. But for, for me, it's it's really solving problems for the consumer that we see as holes. And mm-hmm. I think it really goes back to, too, this isn't necessarily part of the brand book, but the type of entrepreneur that I am. There's a lot of there's a handful of different ways that um, entrepreneurs operate, I guess, or, or mm-hmm. sort of start companies. And I think for, for me, I, this was the first company that I had started. It was really finding those holes in the market um, mm-hmm. that didn't exist. I not only launched a new product and a new company, but also a new category. Mm-hmm. That's insane to launch mm-hmm. a new category. And it takes a long time when you're, mm-hmm. because you, you have to wait for the consumer to catch up mm-hmm. to. So when you think, oh, I got to be really quiet. I can't tell anybody about my idea. When there's no other products in a category that's out there, it's mm-hmm. very, very difficult because you're not only waiting for the consumer, but maybe also the buyers that in mm-hmm. our case that are kind of the gatekeepers to getting your product on the shelf. And so mm-hmm. uh, that you want competition um, to come in and all of that. There's another type of entrepreneur that's out there who is uh, who maybe comes in and sees a few companies in a category and then thinks that they could do it better or I don't know. Mm-hmm. They have more capital to go and and mm-hmm. that those are all possibilities for entrepreneurs. Um, but I think that what we've done at Hint is created this new category in the name of health to really be an advocate for the consumer to find that health. And if we can do that through creating additional products that are not out there, um, mm-hmm. then then that really is is what's meant to be. Yeah, I think that's great advice or great great insight in that first sort of bucket of entrepreneurship you talked about as far as um, there's not always necessarily the market there yet if it's something totally new um, and having to wait and catch up, having the market or at least people wait and catch up. It does take some patience. I think that was a really good call out. I think some people might get discouraged during that phase. Um, you know, it's sort of like, before the before you, it's kind of like the early days of testing it in some ways. Um, and totally. I, I think that I think that we I personally fell more on the second second bucket of that where um, I've been working in the business for a long time. Decided thought there was different ways, more optimal ways of doing it, being either more purpose led, creating less waste within the agency client relationship, both financially and then on the environmental side, um, and you know, and energy for talent. That was just always one of my big um, 
issues within the the ad world was the culture of working people to death, crazy hours. It was due two days ago. Why isn't it done when they just yeah. told you about it? You know, things like that. It's just, I felt there's tons of room for improvement. So that was sort of how I entered uh, my business world or my business life. Yeah. And I, I think that most entrepreneurs, especially brand new entrepreneurs also think, and I think this is probably true in your industry as well, you tell me, but it's like, you worry about the big guys, right? Mm -hmm. You worry about like, well, if we do this really right, they're going to mm -hmm. um, come and, you know, in my case, they're, you're, if you're such a great product, then, you know, Pepsi is going to go knock you off. And mm -hmm. actually another story that I learned is when, you know, the big guy comes and, and knocks you off. I mean, the, most important thing is for you to be able to stay alive and mm -hmm. diversify and not mm -hmm. have all your eggs in one basket because there's room for competition and what ends up happening. And in our case, when we uh, were knocked off and they had relationships that, um, you know, eliminated us from the store temporarily, I'm not going to lie, it was disruptive, but then mm -hmm. they decided not to focus on it anymore because what we felt was a lot of revenue and a big share was yeah. not for them. And so then they discontinued, they got disinterested and they moved on and then yeah. we were still there and we went back. And so sometimes they can actually really solidify that you're, that you're, what you're doing, your category is relevant Mm -hmm. And um, and we gained space just by having competition. But again, mm -hmm. counter to kind of what you thought was, mm -hmm. you know, you go and develop a process and a big agency goes and, and rips that off. And, and then all of a sudden it becomes like standard mm -hmm. for the industry. And then mm -hmm. you become almost known for that. And then mm -hmm. people want to come back to you for being known for that just mm -hmm. one kind of little example there. I don't know if that speaks to you at, at oh, all, totally. but I, I think it really is um, something that I've learned, you know, just through, through the, the journey. Mm -hmm. And but we are, we're getting up on time. I know you have to, you have another appointment after this. Um, so just in this last part of the show, I would love to hear um, as the last ending question, something that I think you would, uh, give advice to yourself, your younger self, whether it's like when you were first starting or back when you were at Time or even AOL, you know, these early days. Um, I would love just to hear some some advice you'd give your, your younger self, even maybe your kids. I mean, you got a bunch of kids now, so maybe yeah. might be one in the same, right? You know, I think in many ways I was doing it, but I wasn't being so purposeful about, about mm -hmm. saying this. But you know, kind of what's the worst that can happen? I I, mm -hmm. I think I probably say that on a daily basis now and mm -hmm. just go out there and try it. If nothing else, the, the ability to laugh at myself, if I thought, oh gosh, I thought that was going to work. I always find that there's little learnings totally. in, in it along the way too. And so, you know, call it risk or call, call it take a chance or just go mm -hmm. out, you know, make that phone call find that email. And it just, it often doesn't turn out exactly how I wanted it to turn out, but it's rare that there isn't something that, that doesn't happen that's good. Yeah. Right. And that yeah. moves it forward. Well, I think the, the question of asking yourself, what's the worst that could happen is a, one of those great questions because that helps you actually talk through the lot, the logic, because I think when we think about it, some of the stuff, some of the fears may be irrational or they're not necessarily like even remotely a possibility, but that the fear factor really kicks in and suddenly it looks like you're looking down a big cliff and you're really, it's just a step down or whatever, you know, for, totally. Um, so I think that was, um, a, a great piece of advice. And that's something I took away from the book and, you know, it's something I, I think I had that, um, mentality before, I won't say before I don't say I'm gonna say mentality, but maybe I, I would ask myself that a lot earlier in my career. Where I said, "What's the worst that could happen? Just try it." Um, and I think as a creative, that's something I should be em embracing more now um, because you know there's lots of creative in experimentation um, that needs to happen. Definitely, and, and you gotta get past that cliff. So I think that's that's great advice. Um, so, Karen, thank, thank yeah, thank you so much for coming on today. We really, I really enjoyed the conversation. 
Thank um, you. I and, appreciate it. And definitely uh, for anybody interested, the, the book is Undaunted and uh, it's also on Audible too. And I'm all over social media at Kara Golden with an I and hopefully you'll reach out and say hi. Yeah, thanks, Kara. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending the last hour with us. I hope you are feeling inspired and having learned something new. Please head on over to the Apple Podcast app and leave a review. See you next week.